Hello, welcome to this lecture on mechanical and thermal energy balances. Mankind uses an enormous amount of energy and with a growing world population the demands for energy will increase further in the coming decades. This increase of energy consumption will lead to problems unless we find new sustainable ways to reduce our energy demand. This is not only important for the process industry but also for our own households. For this reason it's important that we can design houses, buildings and entire chemical processes in a green way. Consequently, proper understanding of the energy balances is important. In this course we introduce the energy balance for continuous processes where liquids flow in and out of a volume and where energy is added by a heater and work may be done on the system. The energy balance is given by the DEDT equals the inflow times the energy concentration minus the outflow times its energy concentration plus a heat flow phi sub Q into the system plus the work represented by phi sub W. In this equation you can recognize in the in and the outflows the internal energy U, the potential energy, the kinetic energy and the pressure energy, all per unit of mass. The last two terms, which are independent of the mass flow rate, represent the heat flow from the heat and additional work performed on the fluid. In this video we will show you that the energy balance is often split in two parts. One part focuses on the mechanical energy and the other part concentrates on the temperature, the so-called thermal energy balance. Before we introduce these balances, we have to remember that a change in internal energy can be written as the product of the heat capacity of the fluid and the temperature difference. That gives delta U equals C sub P times delta T. If we substitute the expression of the internal energy U in the energy balance and rearrange the balance in a mechanical and a thermal part, we obtain the following equation. The EDT equals the flow in times the mechanical concentration in minus that of the outflow plus the work and inflow of thermal energy minus outflow of thermal energy plus the heat added. The upper part of this equation is associated with mechanical energy while the lower part is related to the thermal energy. However, in practice Mechanical energy can be converted into thermal energy via friction. This, represented by E sub friction times phi sub m, becomes visible if we split the two balances in a mechanical energy balance and a thermal energy balance. The new term is called energy dissipation. It is always pointing in one direction. Mechanical energy is converted into heat. The mechanism is friction. It is never the other way around. Friction cannot turn heat into mechanical energy. As you can see, summing up both equations gives the full energy equation back. That's logical. The dissipation is a loss term in the mechanical energy balance and a gain for the thermal energy balance. To get a feeling how much mechanical energy is converted into thermal energy, we could take the following example. Let us consider the flow of one kilogram of water per second through a horizontal pipe under steady state conditions. At point one, the pressure is three bars. At point two, in the tube, the pressure is one bar. We will now pose two questions. First, how much is the liquid heated up by the frictional losses in the tube? And second, what is the power requirement of the pump driving this flow? To answer how much the temperature rises, we take the total energy balance between point one and two. This gives the following equation. We know that there is a steady state which means that nothing changes in time and thus the EDT 
equals zero. Further, we have a horizontal tube, and thus g times h in equals g times h out. The mass flow rate is constant, which means that the average velocity in the tube is a constant, and as a consequence, half v squared in equals half v squared out. There are no heating elements in the tube, and thus the heat flow phi sub q is zero. No work is done by a pump between point 1 and point 2, and thus phi sub w equals zero. The mass flow rate at the entrance is the same as at the outlet. Phi m sub in equals phi m sub out. If we assume that the heat capacity of the fluid is roughly the same at the entrance and at the outlet of the tube, the total energy balance reduces to a very simplified equation. Thus, we see that the mechanical energy in the form of pressure is converted into heat. Clearly friction is at work. Substituting the values for water at 20 degrees Celsius, we obtain a temperature rise of delta T equals delta P over rho C P, which is in this case 0.05 Kelvin. Our second question was, what is the power of the pump that forces the water through the tube? For that, we consider a balance over the pump. This means between points zero and one in our drawing. We assume an ideal pump that does nothing but increasing the pressure. So there is no friction and thus we can neglect thermal effects in the energy balance. This gives us the following equation. The EDT equals the inflow times mechanical energy at the entrance minus outflow times the mechanical energy at the exit plus the work done by the pump. Again we assume a steady state. We assume a horizontal system and constant velocity which leads to the work done by the pump equals the mass flow rate through the tube times the pressure difference over the pump divided by the density which is equal to about 200 watts for this pump. This illustrates how you can use the total energy and the mechanical energy balance separately. Now we will give an example how we can use only the thermal balance. Look at the water cooker. One liter of water is heated from 25 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. How long does it take to heat this water if we have a heating element of 1700 watts? In this case we have no flows, no pump, no change in potential energy or kinetic energy. We use that the heat capacity of water is by and large constant with respect to temperature. This gives us the following thermal energy balance. The EDT thermal equals the time derivative of the mass times the specific heat times the temperature of the water and that equals the heat put in the flow rate of heat. Integrate this equation and put in the values for water and we get for the heating time it equals the mass of water times the specific heat times the temperature rise divided by the heat flow into which is roughly 61 seconds. Summarizing, we can say that the energy balance can be applied to a large variety of problems. We have seen that the total energy balance consists of a mechanical part and the thermal part. In a number of applications, the mechanical part is applied, especially when temperature effects can be neglected. Thanks for watching this video and good luck with the exercises.